Jets flying at high altitude are often followed by a trail of long white clouds, also known as contrails. But how are they produced and why do they only follow jets that are high in the atmosphere? In this animation, we'll learn what contrails are through reviewing what makes up a jet's exhaust, how molecules react at different temperatures, and how raindrops form. This channel is now affiliated with NordVPN, more on them later. The first step in understanding what these trails are that are produced from jet engines is to review the combustion process of the jet engines themselves. A jet engine will suck in oxygen from the atmosphere and mix it with kerosene pumped from its fuel tanks. This combustion process results in an exhaust that is expelled out of the engine at very high temperatures. The exhaust from the engine is a combination of invisible gases, mostly made up of molecules of carbon dioxide and dihydrogen monoxide, which is of course, water. Through the help of stoichiometry, we can find out how much of these gases are being produced. A Boeing 787 burns roughly 1.5 liters of fuel mixed with just over 4 kilograms of oxygen every second when at cruising altitude. This produces 3.7 kilograms of carbon dioxide and over a liter and a half of water in the form of an invisible gaseous vapor. But if the water and carbon dioxide from the engine's exhaust are invisible gases, then why do we see clouds following jets? Well, to understand how this invisible gas turns into clouds, we must learn about the behavior of water molecules when dispersed in the air, and what determines if the water present in the air is visible or not. This is a representation of what humid air looks like on a molecular level. The individual water molecules blend right into the air, appearing invisible because they are separate from each other. Notice how all the molecules are vibrating rapidly and moving around. How quickly they move is their thermal energy, and you can measure this through taking their temperature. Cold molecules move slow, and hot molecules move a lot faster. Keep in mind, a measure of temperature is the average speed of the molecules and there's always molecules moving faster and slower than the average. We can better understand this through this graph, showing us a normal distribution between the number of molecules and their energy at any given temperature. The spike in the center is where most molecules lie, but the further you get away from the average temperature, although there's less and less molecules, there's still an amount of molecules traveling at slower or faster speeds than the average. But how does this control whether water vapor is visible or not? Well, to find out, let's learn more about water molecules found in the air. Although the air molecules are always bumping off each other, the water molecules found in the air are a little different. If we look closely at a single water molecule, we would see a single water molecule is made up of a single oxygen and two hydrogen atoms linked together through covalent bonds. Due to the amount and position of electrons throughout the water molecule, the hydrogen atoms have a partial positive charge and the oxygen atom has a partial negative charge. The difference in charge across the molecule allows it to be somewhat like a magnet to other water molecules. If multiple molecules are close and moving slow enough, a very delicate hydrogen bond will form between the negative and positive ends of two molecules, which is represented by the neon beam. This principle of slow moving molecules joining together is better known as condensation and is paramount in understanding contrails. So in summary, a gas's temperature is the measure of the molecular energy, there's always some molecules moving faster and some moving slower than the average speed, and if the molecules are slow and close enough, they will join together, which is known as condensation. And if they are too excited to stay together, they will break apart, which is better known as evaporation. Let's look at a well-known example of this to fully understand the relationship between temperature and water or humidity found in the air. Let's use an example of a weather forecast with a given temperature and a percentage of relative humidity. So what is the formula behind relative humidity? Is it the ratio of water to air in our atmosphere? Meaning if the humidity reaches 100%, we will be underwater? Well, not exactly. It turns out the relative humidity is derived through comparing how many water molecules are currently present in the air compared to how many water molecules the air can hold before the molecules begin to link together or condense. This is all tied together through a psychrometric chart. In this psychrometric chart, we will see two very familiar variables, one being temperature 
and the other being the amount of humidity in the air. So if you add more water molecules to the air and or lower their temperature or speed, more and more water molecules will begin linking to other water molecules. Although the normal distribution of the water molecule velocity in air predicts that there's always slow enough moving molecules to link together, when the relative humidity reaches 100%, this is when the majority of water molecules will be linking to other water molecules. Now that we have a substantial understanding of the relationship between water molecules and air, let's take what we learned and apply it to our jet engine's exhaust to fully understand how the invisible exhaust turns into big clouds. As the water vapor in the jet's exhaust mixes with the ambient air and cools, the average molecule velocity drops drastically, increasing the amount of hydrogen bonds taking place. This increases the relative humidity rapidly and beyond 100%. So is it this straightforward? Will clouds now form? Well, it turns out there's one more piece of the puzzle in understanding contrails. This last piece is the curvature effect. If we study the very start of a droplet when only a few molecules are beginning to join together, the small radius depicted on the right forces the molecules to not have adjacent molecules to link to, to form hydrogen bonds with. This results in the molecules on the outside of the drop to fall away very easily, driving up the rate of evaporation. This is the curvature effect and will prohibit droplet growth up until the air around the droplet is around 400% relative humidity. But there's a way of skipping this early stage of the droplet's life that is vulnerable to the curvature effect. This is through growing the droplet on a relatively large particulate. As depicted on the left, this large radius of the droplet lowers the angle between molecules, giving the water molecules adjacent molecules to form hydrogen bonds with. But where do we get this particulate to grow our droplet on? Well, thanks to our jet engine, many metal and soot particles are emitted into the jet's exhaust as a result of combustion and engine wear. These relatively large particulates, known as cloud condensation nuclei, start the droplet at roughly 1,000 times the size. This lowers the angle between molecules on the perimeter and allows adjacent molecules to have other molecules to hold onto. This allows the droplet to grow. Now let's follow the size of a droplet as it grows. If we zoom in all the way on this ruler to where each line defines 1 20th of a millimeter, we will see the smallest defined droplet at only 10 microns in size. At this size, they are still invisible to the naked eye and are a similar size to a red blood cell. If their environment has sufficient humidity, they will continue to grow. At 30 to 100 microns in size, we find fog or cloud. At this size, although they are still buoyant in air, in numbers, they are visible to the naked eye. This is their size compared to a single grain of salt. If the droplet still continues to grow, they will finally be defined as a raindrop at 500 microns in size, or half a millimeter. At this size, gravity will begin to pull them to Earth. On their way down, they will often collide with others and can grow to 4,000 microns, or 4 millimeters in size. Any larger, they often break into two droplets. An interesting thing to note is at this size, in free fall, the droplet will actually take on the geometry of the droplet on the right, as the hydrogen bonds fight the air resistance to hold the droplet together. Now that we've learned about the behavior of water molecules at different concentrations and temperatures, be sure to keep an eye out for other applications. Besides the weather, another great example is observing a hot cup of water. If the conditions are appropriate, you will see a gap in between the surface of the liquid and the cloud produced. This is where water vapor, as a gas, is present. As the vapor mixes with the ambient air and cools, it surpasses its dew point and it condenses on dust particles found in the air. This causes the vapor to become visible. But as these tiny water droplets continue to mix with the warm and dry air, they soon break up and evaporate into invisible water vapor once again. Fog or low-lying cloud will form when the ground cools the warm, humid air at night, for example. And also, why warm, humid air will drop below its dew point when coming into contact with the cold coke can, producing condensation. Now let's take a look at NordVPN. I've been using NordVPN for several years now, and I'm thrilled to now be affiliated with them. For those who are not familiar with NordVPN, NordVPN acts as a secure gateway between you and the internet. Your internet traffic is inherently vulnerable, especially when accessing the internet in public areas. But with NordVPN, your traffic is routed through a VPN that encrypts the data and therefore cannot be traced to you. 
By choosing where your VPN is, through one click, you can virtually switch cities and access the internet on up to six devices as if you were anywhere in the world, allowing you to access content and websites that would otherwise be inaccessible. There's many benefits with signing up to NordVPN. I urge you to follow the link in the bio to learn more about them and use my coupon code to get a great discount. Thanks for watching this animation and I'll see you on the next one.